Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Freely Nourish, the podcast that empowers you to break the cycle of dieting by teaching you to nourish your body well. I am your host, registered dietitian, Erin Casey, and I am the owner of New You Nutrition Counseling, where we believe that you can reach all of your health goals at just about any body size, and you can definitely include all of your favorite foods in your health journey. Uh, Today, I have a popular request for you all. Um, we are going to be talking about PMS, uh, so premenstrual syndrome. If you are not someone who menstruates and this does not apply to you and you don't want to listen to it, uh, by all means, feel free to scroll on to the next episode. Uh, but that said, I feel as though if someone in your life does menstruate, uh, it, it may be beneficial for you to tune in, um, just because, you know, just because you are not the one menstruating does not mean that someone else's menstrual cycle does not affect you. Um, so I think this is, uh, these are questions that I actually get quite often. Um, and something that I'm really kind of excited to, to deep dive a little bit deeper into. So let's get into it. Right. So those of us who do menstruate know that it is, um, the, the week of your period uh, is a mess, <laughs> right? We are typically, uh, you're bleeding for one, uh, but then you also are typically very tired, uh, often bloated. You have kind of quite a bit of like extra water weight hanging around your midsection. Um, sometimes we experience moodiness, uh, irritability. A lot of us have a hard time sleeping during that time or kind of feel like our sleep just isn't quite as sound as it is during other times of the month, um, lots of cramping (laughs) and and abdominal discomfort. A lot of us have back pain too associated with that discomfort. Um, your GI system is very often a mess. That's actually very normal. A lot of people don't realize that it's normal, but it is. We'll talk about that much more later on. Um, but there's definitely GI disturbances. Um, and, uh, you know, migraines are actually a very common side effect of, of a menstrual cycle. Um, so lots of things, right. Lots of, lots of really uncomfortableness. Um, and anybody who menstruates knows that it's not just the week of your period that is problematic, right. Um, everybody's cycle is slightly different, right. So all of this is hormone driven, right. So I think it's kind of important to recognize that first and foremost, this is caused by, you know, a sudden drop in estrogen and progesterone levels, but how quickly that happens is going to vary person to person. Um, so therefore kind of what the week before your period feels like and the week after your period, um, you know, there's some commonalities, but some of us really don't have a good time. Like we have, like I have one good week a year, right. Or a month rather. Like I, like the week after my period is great. Then I start to get a little bit bloated. Then I'm really crampy and like, just kind of not feeling myself and tired the week before my period. And then like the week of I'm just in pain, but I'm not tired. Other people have other experiences. Um, so it, it really can kind of throw you for a loop. Um, so, you know, I definitely want to kind of talk through kind of some of the key nutritional things that you can do uh, to support yourself during, during this time, partly, you know, during the time of your period, just because for most of us who do menstruate, that tends to be kind of the worst of it, but also just to support yourself kind of generally speaking. Um, and we'll actually kind of start there. So um, generally speaking, all of the hormones, that affect your menstrual cycle. So things like progesterone, estrogen, progesterone, estrogen, uh, luteinizing hormone, things like that. All of those are cortisol based hormones. So what that means is that they are based, like they're based in fat molecules, which I know that sounds really weird to think about. It's not fat from like, you know, your, your belly fat or something like that gets broken off and made into hormones. That's not what happens. What happens is your body circulates the blood lipids on a regular basis. Um, and they form these molecules that then go and do all of their different signaling things. Um, so a lot of signaling molecules are peptide or protein based, uh, hormones in fact are fat based. So they're, they're kind of composed of fat like molecules. They're very important and very specific, but that's ultimately what they are. And that kind of just comes down to like a molecular level difference. Um, but that said, foods that you can eat kind of consistently to support good hormone health are things that contain fats. So things like fatty fish. So things like, you know, tuna and salmon are kind of like the poster children for those. Um, but there, but there certainly are others. Shellfish in general does have a, a good bed of fat. So things like lobster, crab, you know, all of these yummy things, clams, um, 
That said, those things also contain a good bit of saturated fat, which is actually good for hormone production, but it can be it can adversely affect your heart health if it's overdone. Um, so that's kind of why the, the tuna and salmon are always recommended is because they only have those omega threes, which are the, uh, kind of anti-inflammatory looser fat molecules that don't clog up your arteries. But most sources of seafood do have a good bit of fat. Um, there's just usually some cholesterol mixed in with that. And obviously if it's fried and things like that, that's going to, that's going to increase that too. Um, so, but that's that, you know, fatty, fatty fishes, really kind of any type of seafood. The general recommendation is actually to eat uh, fish two times per week. If it is something that you enjoy, if it is not something, like if you're just one of those people who I don't like seafood, I can't stand the taste of it, the smell of it. That's fine. That's totally fine. You can get these nutrients elsewhere. And I'm going to tell you where else to get them, but um you know, definitely don't feel like you, you have to eat fish to, to, to support home and health. You don't have to, but fish is a good option. Um, nuts and seeds really of any kind. Um, and then in particular, we'll kind of talk about this during your, your period, things that come like pumpkin seeds, squashes, anything that comes from like a gourd type vegetable, those are actually rather rich in iron as well, which can help support, um, you know, iron stores during, during times of blood loss. Um, but nuts and seeds in general, really any variety of nuts and seeds, almonds, pistachios, peanuts, um, I'm trying to think, uh, walnuts, <laughs> I'm losing track of all my nuts here. Uh, Brazil nuts, any of those are, they're all great sources of, of those fats that are going to help kind of support hormone production. Um, avocados, nut butter, so like peanut butter, uh, even Nutella has a good bit of fat in it. So things like that are, are generally very good. Um, just to kind of give your body the resources it needs to adequately produce the hormones that it, that it needs to, to regulate your cycle. Um, now, when, when we get to whatever you want to call it, right, your, your monthly visitor or rant flow or whatever, I'm just going to call it a period because that's what it is. <laughs> and, and really when you say menstrual cycle, that refers to the entire month, it refers to the entire cycle of hormones. So some people say menstrual cycle when they mean your period week. I'm just going to call it your period because that's what it is. And we're all grown ups here. So when it comes to the week of your period, um, a couple of other things kind of come into play, primarily relating to the loss of blood. So you know, quick anatomy lesson to anyone who is listening. If you menstruate, I really hope you know this already. Um, but if you don't menstruate and like kind of, if you know some things, but you're not entirely sure, just kind of real quick overview of female anatomy and kind of why, why this is all happening. So during earlier stages, so usually about two weeks before your period, your body releases, or it's supposed to release an egg from your ovaries. That egg travels down your fallopian tube and goes into your uterus, which is kind of like our little, our little female bat cave, if you will. Um, once it is there, it's kind of just hanging out for a couple of days waiting to get fertilized. If it is not fertilized, then your body just sheds not only the egg itself, but basically it has spent all month kind of building up this nice pillowy nest inside your female bat cave. I'm calling it a female bat cave because that sounds powerful and not the like misery that <laughs> typically comes with, uh, with menstruation. So, um, your, your body has spent all month kind of creating this nice pillowy, enjoyable environment for this egg to land in with the intention that if that egg is fertilized, it's going to implant and it's going to result in a pregnancy. Now, if that doesn't happen, uh, basically your body needs to shed all of that and get it and start all over. So we basically have this uterus that, you know, is originally kind of, you know, maybe the size of a grapefruit or something or, or so it is swollen. It is swollen to about the size of a football, um, towards the end of, you know, when you're getting ready to truly shed, uh, a football may be a little bit large for, for some people, but it's, it's significantly larger <laughs> than, than it is normally. And I think that's something people don't really appreciate enough. It's just like how much space that inflamed uterus is actually taking up. Um, it is, it is actually significantly larger. So things like, you know, you know, if your pants don't fit the same and stuff like that, it's not just water weight. There is water retention around it. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but honestly, your uterus is just larger in and of itself. It's larger. Um, so, so yeah, your pants might fit different because you basically have, you know, a, a football inside your stomach. Um, 
So I think that's something that people don't really appreciate very often, but then also you are shedding a significant amount of that. And what shedding means, it, it, that's that's where the bleeding comes in. You basically are, you know, all of this pillowiness is basically various fluid types. Um, it's a lot of uh, mucus. It's a lot of blood. Um, and basically all of that just exits out the vagina and comes right out. Um, and it, you know, it, it's heavier and lighter for some of us over others, but, you know, everybody's losing, um, you know, all of us are losing blood at some point. Um, how much blood you lose does kind of mitigate kind of how much you need certain kind of, you know, nutritional, um, supplementation or requirements or things like that. So, um, I will say that pretty much for everything I'm going to say from here on out in this podcast, kind of, if you're not a heavy bleeder, it's kind of less of a concern. And if you are a heavy bleeder, it's kind of more of a concern. So, uh, just to kind of keep that in the back of your mind, all of these things are beneficial to anyone who menstruates, but just to kind of keep in mind kind of how significant or how important they really are. Um, that kind of really depends on, on how heavily you're bleeding. And that may vary for you from month to month. Um, you may have some months that are lighter and, and some that are heavier and kind of what you do about that nutritionally may vary just depending on, on where you're at. Um, so just to kind of, you know, be clear, you know, your uterus is very swollen. Um, that, 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 that feels uncomfortable, right? One, it, it pushes your stomach out. So you kind of feel a little bit distended, but it's also pushing on other things, <laughs> right? Um, anyone who has ever carried a child can tell you that kind of once they get to be, you know, like 15 or so weeks, like they start to feel that their body feels different uh, because they have a baby in there squishing all kinds of things around. Um, the closest things for that uterus to push on is going to be your digestive system. So it's going to be things like your stomach, your colon, your small intestine, things like that. Now we don't necessarily think about like sensation in our colon for the most part, right? But it, the nervous system that controls your uterus comes. So basically you have a big nerve that comes off the, of your back, off of your spine, and it wraps all the way around into kind of your abdominal cavity. And then there's various branchings that happen there that control your digestive system and your, um, your reproductive anatomy as well. And that that's really for everybody that that's, you know, male and female anatomy. Um, but you know, kind of in the context of PMS, it controls your uterus and your stomach. Now we used to think that nerves were kind of a one-way street. So we used to think that, okay, the signal came from your brain and went down your spine and then it branched out to wherever it was going. And then like it, you know, just sent the signal that way. So theoretically, oh, okay, well it, you know, it comes off my spine and then it goes to either my stomach or my, my uterus. We've since learned that they are actually very bi-directional so that there are signals that could certainly do come from the brain and go and kind of signal to your, your various digestive organs and your reproductive organs. And there are signals that come from those organs and go back to the brain. Um, so basically what happens a lot of times too, is that inflammation in the uterus is essentially agitating that whole nervous system. So it prompts more, more digestive motility typically. Now that can look different for different people. It can look like just kind of more frequent bowel movements. Um, but sometimes it also is more urgent bowel movements. It can also be, um, you know, more liquid bowel movements, um, to an extent, some of that is normal, uh, but it can be to an extent debilitating too, depending on how severe it is. And generally speaking, kind of the stronger your cramps are, which is kind of like that inflammatory nerve response, the worse your digestive problems are as well. Uh, not always, there's not always a correlation, but, um, uh, that's, there's, there's likely a lot of that, um, Oh, there's likely a relationship between the two. So things to help with that are, um, our vitamin B6 is actually really, really helpful. And it's kind of, that's one that's been known probably for the longest. I would say the oldest study when I was looking this up was I think in the 19, either late fifties, early sixties. So we've kind of known that B6 is, um, helpful 
during the time of your period uh, for, for most people who menstruate. Um, it definitely helps with cramps. It has also, there's a couple of studies that have assessed mood. Um, so, and, and it shows to be helpful there. Uh, the dose recommendation is typically about a hundred milligrams per day. Uh, and you would generally recommend that just kind of during the days of your heaviest flow. Um, so for, for some of us, you know, our flow starts out really heavy and then it kind of lightens up. Some of us, it starts a little lighter, then gets heavier, then tapers off. So kind of, you know, the day when you're having kind of like the worst cramps, you can take it at any time. It's not going to be harmful at any point in time during your period. Uh, that said, it's kind of most beneficial during those kind of heavier flow days. Um, so B6, hundred milligrams was the most common dose that I found recommended, but there were studies that show that, you know, as low as 50 milligrams is effective. Um, so kind of take with that what you will. Um, other things to consider are kind of the, the blood loss itself, as well as kind of the fluid loss. Um, so obviously you lose fluid while you are bleeding, of course, uh, but you also are losing fluids otherwise. So a lot of times because we've been retaining water for a couple of days prior to our period, when that, you know, the, the egg releases and we're kind of shedding that uterine lining, we are also kind of letting go of some of that water retention. For most of us, that feels <laughs> actually a little bit better. Um, but especially if you have a heavy flow as well, it can put you in somewhat a kind of like a dangerous territory for uh, dehydration um, and particularly electrolyte imbalances. So if you are drinking a, a significant amount of water and kind of drinking, you know, what you should be in terms of water, um, you likely aren't at risk in terms of actual fluid loss. But that said, you are shedding electrolytes, particularly with that, that heavier blood flow as well. So a lot of times I will recommend like a, a Gatorade or Powerade or, you know, liquid IV, any of the, anything that has electrolytes in it, um, you know, maybe once a day during those heaviest days, as your period lightens up and the flow lightens up, it's, it becomes less and less necessary. But especially if you're somebody who works out and is sweating a lot as well on top of kind of, you know, this heavy blood flow, then I definitely recommend, you know, supplementing with something that's got both sodium and potassium in it. Um, so things like, you know, noon, Pedialyte, um, Gatorade, Powerade, um, all of those are fine. The sugar-free options are fine. The regular options are fine. Um, and I usually recommend about one per day, um, unless you've got, you know, if you're also, you know, outside for, for six hours in the, the hot sun, then, you know, you're going to need to replenish more than that, but that doesn't really have anything to do with your period. You just need to replenish more. Um, so those are kind of the the big things to think about there. Um, also with the blood loss, people don't really think about this, but, uh, it took your body a lot of calories to, to build that, <laughs> to build your little nest. Um, so again, kind of depending on your body and how it tends to fluctuate. So for me personally, I know that I get really tired the week before my period, and I'm actually less tired the week of my period. Some people are the opposite. Um, but usually with that fatigue also comes increased hunger, which is normal. That is actually really, really normal. Um, and again, for some people it's before your period, some people it's during your period, some people it's after your period, but basically it's kind of what has happened is your body has expended an enormous amount of energy. Really like it depends how much you are bleeding, but it can be upwards of like a thousand calories. Like most of it's at at least 500 calories and some of us even a thousand calories. Um, if you, if you bleed heavier, um, that's a lot of calories that, that your body is kind of just losing over the course of a week. Uh, so I think again, diet culture tells us that we're not supposed to crave things. Um, and we're, we're not supposed to be more hungry than normal. Sometimes if you have those days when you're just like a bottomless pit, it, it could well be because your body's trying to build a little nest, <laughs> right? Um, it, it may be as simple as that. And it may be a nest that it's going to shed, but it doesn't know that at that time. Um, so I think it's just kind of important to be kind to yourself and remember that, you know, if your body's hungrier than normal, if it's more tired than normal, it's doing something, it's building something, it's getting ready to shed something like something is happening inside your body that you probably are well served to listen to. So 
just to kind of put that out there, I generally don't make rec- you know specific recommendations for extra calories during your period, just because everyone is so different. But I do definitely encourage you to listen to your hunger cues and, and to honor them and don't beat yourself up about it because frankly, that that's normal. Um, it is very normal for you to be hungrier before, during, or after your period. Again, that kind of just depends on your flow and your metabolism, but, um, it's, it's definitely important to, to listen and it's normal to need more calories. Um, Another big thing with the blood loss that we definitely see is anemia. So that can definitely happen. What we have learned with iron deficiency anemia is that really some people's bodies just hold on to iron, really no problem. And some people's bodies just don't, um, the people whose bodies, if, you know, if you've never been anemic and you've never, you know, had a problem with low iron or anything like that, to be honest, this probably doesn't apply to you. Um, because even in the, in the midst of your menstruation, you're probably not, your body's holding on to enough iron that it's, it's going to be okay. Um, that said, if you were somebody who has been anemic in the past, kind of independent of your period, um, and, and, you know, you've, you've ever been told that you need to take an iron supplement or, or you, you know, can't give blood because you don't have enough iron or things like that. Um, yeah, you know, this is something you may want to kind of tune into because during your period, you are losing more blood than normal. Right. Um, so it's kind of even the iron that you do have, like it's, it's kind of fading <laughs> very quickly. Um, certainly you can get prescription iron supplements. Um, that probably would be my first my first recommendation for you is to get an, an I, a good iron supplement from your doctor. Um, and to take it, a lot of people don't know this, but iron and vitamin C are very good buddies. So when we take iron, we actually recommend that we take it either with a vitamin C supplement or with some foods that's high in vitamin C. So that can be, you know, grapefruit, orange juice, um, honestly, even like, you know, watermelon and things like that have a, have a good bit of vitamin C. Vitamin C just helps iron get absorbed better. Um, so that's something that, you know, if you are on an iron supplement and you want to kind of just get the most out of it, adding on a vitamin C supplement, regardless of, of, you know, any menstruation issues, you, um, you know, that that's just helpful. It helps your iron absorb a lot better. Um, that said, a lot of people don't tolerate iron supplements very well, um, or they're not like anemic enough that their doctor has written them a prescription for it. Um, so if that's the case, what I recommend is just kind of while you're on your period. And again, these are those heavier flow days, try to eat foods. Honestly, if you can, like if you, if your period is predictable enough to kind of know when it's coming fortifying yourself with iron for like three or four days ahead of time can actually be really helpful. Um, when people think of iron, you know, iron rich foods, like the first thing that comes to everybody's mind is beef. Um, and beef is a very great source of iron, but so is Turkey. So are eggs. Um, so are, you know, pretty well, any meat is going to have a decent amount of iron. Red meat does have more, um, but it doesn't have to be red meat all the time. Um, if that's what you want to hear, to kind of hear as a a reason to eat a cheeseburger every month, then go for it. That's, that's fine. Um, other kind of non-meat foods that are rich in iron. Um, this is again, where like our pumpkin and squash seeds kind of come into hand, um, and spinach are kind of the, the tops, um, cooked spinach, raw spinach, it it doesn't matter any of it. Um, a lot of times I recommend people adding spinach into like a smoothie, uh, just because that's a way to get a lot of it in without necessarily having to like chomp it, (laughs) chomp it all down. Um, so, so that's definitely something to think about. We already talked about B6, um, as being helpful and magnesium is actually something that has kind of a little bit newer to the, to the research game, um, that, that can be helpful. Um, magnesium is helpful. We know is, is helpful a lot of times for sleep, um, as well as for constipation. Um, so I think kind of basically somebody kind of put it together and be like, huh, if we supplement magnesium, does it help with PMS symptoms? And it turns out it does. Um, Um, it's been shown to help with mood, sleep, anxiety. It actually has been shown to help mildly with migraines. Um, so that's a big one. Migraines probably come with, you know, a combination of just kind of triggering your nervous system, um, 
magnesium helps with that for sure, but also definitely making sure you're hydrated enough too. Um, that can help as well as some kind of relaxation tactics, which we're going to talk about in a minute relating to digestive issues, but they also help with migraines and things like that as well. Um, so, uh, you know, definitely, you know, it helps with all the GI symptoms. It can help with sleep. It can help with mood as well. Um, the dose of magnesium really has varied from all of the studies I read. Honestly, it was about anywhere from like 300 to 500 milligrams was a recommendation for just PMS things. If you struggle with constipation, uh, the recommended dose is about 2000 milligrams per day. Um, so it's a little bit higher if you're dealing with constipation, but other than that, about 500 milligrams was kind of the average of what I saw. Um, honestly, a lot of people take magnesium supplements to help with all of these issues kind of all month long. Right. But certainly if you know that kind of your period week is a time when you have, you know, a harder time sleeping, um, you know, maybe you just have some GI irregularities or, um, you know, just overall, you just kind of find yourself a little bit more anxious or irritable during that time. Um, magnesium would definitely be a good thing to add. Uh, B6 with it is actually really effective too. So kind of adding those two back in, um, foods that are super rich in magnesium are things like legumes. Um, so, you know, beans, lentils, um, peanuts are actually considered a legume as well. And they have a decent amount of magnesium and then kind of all of our dark leafy vegetables, onion, or I'm sorry, yeah, spinach included, but also, you know, kale, collard greens, etc. Um, and so that's kind of a, another little tidbit there. And then finally, um, let's talk about the pooping, right? Because we all know if you menstruate, you know, that like your poops are different during, during your period. Um, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's just different. Um, so as I just said, magnesium can certainly help with some of that. If you find that you struggle with constipation, even, you know, just in general, outside of your period, uh, about two grams or 2000 milligrams grams is kind of what I would recommend for you. If you tend to, um, fall to the other end of the spectrum and you're having kind of more frequent liquidy, more urgent bowel movements, um, a fiber supplement, such as either Metamucil or Consul are, are my two favorites. Um, those are the brand names. The type of fiber is called psyllium husk, which is spelled with a P. So it's P S Y L L I U M. Um, and that is a bulking fiber. So I think it's really important when we think about different fiber supplements, they're not all created equal. Um, Metamucil and Consul and like any store variety knockoff of those two things, as long as it's a psyllium husk, um, it will be a bulking type of fiber. Um, those help to kind of gel up loose bowel movements, which both helps to reduce the number of bowel movements you have, but almost more importantly helps to make them less urgent because you don't have all this water kind of crashing into the end of your rectum telling you that you've got to release it right now. You've got kind of a more solid, more formed stool and it's less urgent to pass. Um, other fiber supplements, so things like Fibercon, um, Citrusel, Benefiber, et cetera, those have some soluble fiber in them, but they also have a lot of insoluble fiber in them, which can actually make things like diarrhea worse. Um, so they don't really help that much to relieve constipation, but um, they, they definitely make uh, diarrhea a little bit worse. So I would stay away from those if diarrhea is what you tend to have. Um, and I would focus a little bit more on the, on the psyllium husk. Um, um, foods that are really rich in those soluble fibers are going to be things like oatmeal, um, is a really rich source and things like apples and pears, but only if they are peeled. Um, so a lot of times that outer peel of those types of vegetables are a little bit harder for our bodies to digest. So during a time, if you're having some diarrhea, um, eating either, you know, like canned pears over a fresh pear, eating applesauce over a, a fresh apple or peeling the fruit and then eating it. Um, that can be really helpful because you're getting the soluble fiber that your body needs without the insoluble fiber. That's going to be problematic for it. Um, 
generally speaking, if you tend to have kind of just a lot of like painful diarrhea, I recommend doing cooked vegetables and fruits. So like canned fruit over raw, um, cooked veggies over raw, just because again, that fiber content is a little bit less and it just makes them a little bit more digestible. You can go back to eating raw fruits and vegetables after your period, but kind of during those, those couple of days where it's really rough, um, eating some, cooking down your fruits and vegetables can be helpful. Um, other things that can help. So again, all of this goes back to our nervous system, right? So that's kind of where we started this and kind of where we'll end it. Um, so if we think about, okay, basically what is happening is that that nerve is getting overactivated by your inflamed, um, uterus and that's sending those same signals kind of around in your digestive cavity. So things that can help to kind of calm down the nervous system are uh, things like heating and cooling packs. So kind of just putting heating and cooling packs on your, on your abdomen, it'll help with your cramps as well. Um, things like breath work. So kind of, you know, um, three, one, four breathing, um, you know, just, kind of any kind of guided meditation can be helpful. Um, even icing, you know, on the, either putting ice packs on your abdomen or even putting them like kind of right here on your sternum. Sorry, you guys can't see me, but, um, putting them right here on your sternum can kind of help cool that central nervous system and kind of calm it down. Um, you know, any kind of those anxiety mitigating, uh, techniques can be really helpful. Um, so that, that can also help to, to ease some of the digestive upset as well during, during your period. And then of course, if it's, if it's really bad things like Imodium, um, and, and Pepto-Bismol and stuff like that, um, Imodium will pretty much, you know, stop it <laughs> in its tracks if it's, it is really getting in your way. Um, so that is kind of, you know, all I have for you today. I hope you found it helpful. Um, a lot of times people really don't realize, and just because, you know, we're, we're cultured to believe that having a period makes you weak. It takes you out of the game. So we're like not supposed to think about it or complain about it or, or anything like that. And that's all bullshit. Like this shit sucks. Like it sucks to have a period. Um, and it, and it can be really miserable. So people kind of forget how much TLC they actually need. So you definitely need extra calories at some point in your cycle. Um, you definitely probably need extra fluids at some point during your cycle. Um, you may or may not be losing iron too. So that might be something to kind of pay attention to. Um, most of us have some type of GI yuckiness going on. <laughs> they can go all different ends of the spectrum. Um, but you can definitely kind of, you know, again, do gentle foods, um, on your, on your digestive tract, try to stay away from those raw fruits and vegetables, take a fiber supplement, like a bulking fiber supplement, if you need to. Um, and then all of the things that can calm your central nervous system can also calm your digestive system. So breath work and meditation and heating and cooling and things like that. Um, and then of course, you know, there's, there's supplements, right? So I mentioned the fiber supplement. There's also B6 and magnesium, um, B6, we usually recommend anywhere from 50 to hundred milligrams per day. And then magnesium, usually about 500 milligrams per day, unless it's explicitly for constipation, in which case it's more, um, it is about two milligram. I'm sorry, 2000 milligrams at bedtime, um, but those are all things for you to try. And then of course, all of our, um, you know, good, healthy fats help us just support good hormone cycling in general. So things like fatty fish, nuts, seeds, avocados, peanut butter, um, things like that. So I hope you all have found this helpful. If you would like more information, please leave me comments. I'll be happy to kind of post a follow-up or answer any questions. Um, if you thought that this was just like the most useful thing you've ever heard, and you want to know more about how you can use nutrition to better your own life, uh, head on over to our website. I'll post it in the show notes and, you know, book yourself a free discovery call. It's hundred percent free. It's about 15 minutes minutes long. We basically just sit down and talk about, you know, what it is that you want to accomplish with your health and how it is that we as dietitians can potentially plug in and help you. Um, there's no, you know, pressure, no guarantees, no nothing. We just sit down and see if it's a good fit. And if it is, then we give you the opera, you know, all of our options for, for booking and, you know, one-on-one -on -one sessions and things like that. So definitely check that out. Um, 
keep the recommendations coming for different podcast content. I'm always looking for more suggestions. So um, please keep them coming. And I hope uh, you all have a great rest of your week and I will talk to you next time.